Back when real-time and turn-based strategy games were all the rage in the early 2000s, the genre seemed to get a new game every week. And while many were entries into established series such as Civilization, Total War or Warcraft, some were totally new titles ready to ride or die on the quality of the product alone. Games like Stronghold, Hearts of Iron or Empire Earth were all some of the lucky newcomers that managed to gain a foothold in a market that was becoming more and more saturated with games recycling a formula that was very quickly beginning to lose its novelty. And as a result, a lot didn't make it, and unfortunately their names were forgotten to the sands of time. Nevertheless, the newly founded Big Huge Games was ready to take a shot at it, and in 2003 they delivered their first ever game to a market that was just as likely to rip their work to shreds as it was to ignore it entirely. But their gamble paid off. The game was Rise of Nations, and it was met with near universal acclaim upon release, receiving review scores averaging 89%. It went on to garner multiple Game of the Year and Strategy Game of the Year awards from a variety of publications such as GameSpot, GameSpy, or PC Gamer, who are also saying things like the game was a blueprint for the genre's future, and this is how RTS games should be made from here on out. And looking back, I can wholeheartedly agree with those statements. The new features the game brings to the table, along with the overall quality of everything included, was enough to set the game in stone as a pillar of excellence in the genre, and one that's still talked about and played to this day. It was also a commercial success, with the game and its expansion selling over a million copies in its lifetime. I first played it as a demo back in late 2003, and it was just the kind of game I was into at the time. I mostly played RTSs back then, and after basically playing Impossible Creatures non-stop for a lot longer than I'd care to admit, Rise of Nations provided a welcome change of pace with its overall slower style and deeper gameplay. So how does it stack up 15 years later? Is it still as engaging and rewarding as it used to be? Rise of Nations core gameplay is fairly similar to what you find in other strategy games at the time. As with your typical RTS, you're advancing tech trees to build bases and armies with the ultimate goal of completing one of the game's victory conditions, which is most commonly going to be wiping your enemy from existence. However, as the name suggests, in this game you're not simply building a city or an army, or two for that matter. You're building a whole nation. We aren't messing around with small towns or villages here. In this game, almost every aspect is upscaled, so you go big or go home. The in-game time frame for a playthrough is often longer than most of the game's contemporaries like Age of Empires or Warcraft 3. Instead of advancing through maybe a few hundred years of technology, here it's thousands, 6,000 to be exact, and the game starts you in the Dark Ages and it takes you right up through to the current day and even slightly into the future. Infantry units are also built in threes, which leads to having much larger armies and having them built a lot faster. Maps are huge and you can accommodate multiple nations all with multiple cities and each nation has their own territory which everyone can see on the map. It all equates to a grander sense of scale overall. Your actions and decisions therefore feel as though they have much greater consequence and any move you make in the start of the game will have a noticeable ripple throughout all aspects of your society and its economy as the game progresses. For example, if you start the game with only a few workers, the placement of your first cities are crucial and you must place them smartly to make sure you make the most of the map's resources. And these effects that you do, whether ultimately beneficial or detrimental, will drastically change how your nation's history will be written. Rise of Nations graphics also work with the game's scale, and mostly everything has a realistic and authentic look to it. One of the things I like about the visuals is that everything is, I'm going to say mostly, in proportion. Especially with people and land vehicles, a lot of the ships are a lot smaller than they should be in some of the buildings obviously, but generally speaking, especially in the early stages of the game, it's all in proportion. Proportion in real-time strategy games is something that I'm pretty picky about, and obviously like I said, except for some buildings and ships, uh, everything's mostly rightly sized here, which is something I really like. For comparison, if you're looking at something like Empire Earth 2, it's a similar game, but its proportions are way off and it really annoyed me so much that I actually stopped playing it whenever I first started it back in the day. But in saying all that, big isn't always better. So scale aside, how does the game actually play? 
Well, the gameplay is based around territory, which is determined and increased by your city placement and research. So for the most part, buildings can only be constructed in your own territory, and units will take attrition damage when they're in your opponent's territory, and can also heal when you're in yours if you've got the appropriate research. Space is always at a premium, and your nation's claims must be managed effectively and protected at all costs by keeping your cities intact. Something with this game is that once someone's built a city, it can't be destroyed, only captured. So when you build the city, it'll extend your territory, but if someone captures the city, they will take that city's territory from you and add it to their own. Resources are handled differently to other strategy games here as well, as they're gathered in a way that I think I much prefer. So instead of having your villagers move resources from a source to a drop-off, like nearly every other RTS, you instead construct a building that they quote-unquote work at, and they generate a certain amount of resources per second. For example, if you put a lumber camp next to a forest, you can assign workers to that camp to passively generate wood for your economy. And the number of workers you can assign is determined by how rich the supply is in the adjoining resource, so you can't farm it too much, you need to be expanding and getting new resources as the game progresses. And what's nice about it is that these resources never run out, so you don't have to worry about micromanaging that aspect of the game like you would in like Age of Empires, where the light game can get a bit annoying when you're always moving around villages to find new stacks of resources. Another little feature worth mentioning is that opposed to other RTSs, other workers will automatically start doing something after a certain amount of time just standing there. So for example, if you were to build five workers to work a lumber camp but you forgot to assign them, they will eventually do it themselves after a short while. Little features like that are really nice and they let you focus on what's important, building your nation and working towards a victory. The most common way you'll be winning a game of Rise of Nations is through a war of attrition through military might, and while there are other victory conditions available, building massive armies and rolling through your opponent's cities is assuredly more fun. And the range of ages to advance through with your accompanying research and unit types keeps games fresh and exciting, even when they go on for quite a while. The game succeeds in making sure there's interesting and worthwhile unlocks with each age you progress through. Certain resources, buildings and unit categories are made available as your nation makes more and more technological advances, which is a great way to keep it fresh throughout. For example, the industrial age, which is the level 6 age, unlocks the use of primitive aircraft as well as armoured vehicles, and ballistic missiles coming the age after in the modern age. This diversity also means that if you beat your opponents to later stages of the game, you can have some hilarious matchups where your fancy new tanks and fighter aircraft might be going up against your opponent's horse archers or swordsmen on the battlefield. And something cool to note is that if you choose, you can limit what ages are available. So if you'd rather keep it old school, you can make it so that no one can research past the medieval age, which means everyone will be sticking to swords and arrows and you won't have to worry about that pesky gunpowder. On the contrary, you can just skip all that and start right at the industrial age to get right into the action with aircraft and armoured cars, whatever works for you. And while I obviously can't cover everything in this video, trust me when I say that you won't be lacking in new things to build, research and destroy throughout your time with the game. Especially with the game's multiple civilizations and ages and unique units that each civilization has. Other things like the wide variety of buildable wonders that all give unique bonuses, or the way cities interact inside your nation as hubs for trade and civilization are just a few of the things that you'll be doing. There's even a mode that plays like the board game Risk, and it lets you engage in battles in real time, as well as campaigns based off real events in history that let you choose how you might have handled them. The soundtrack and effects in Rise of Nations are pretty much how I expect strategy game audio to be. Functional, but nothing spectacular. Starting with the soundtrack, it works as a backdrop to the gameplay, but doesn't really do anything to surprise the listener. It's somewhat average in my opinion, and while games in this genre do often have soundtracks that kind of just fade into the background, I feel like they could have done a bit more with it. It's definitely not bad but it's not anything that sticks with me, and let's just say I won't be humming it on the bus like some other soundtracks. As for the effects, I think they're in a similar boat, though maybe a notch or two above than the soundtrack. Could just be because of the game's diversity, but I really like how each age has sound effects that suit the time period they're going for. And I do respect the effort the developers put into making audio for all the unit types and buildings in the game. It helps make each age feel unique, and it successfully serves to stop them from bleeding into one another too much.
Due to the game's success and acclaim, Rise of Nations did receive one expansion after release. Thrones and Patriots was released in mid-2004 and it brought a host of new features to the game. It introduced a few new nations, some new units, wonders, as well as a government system that lets you define your nation in more of an extent than before. New campaigns were also added, enabling players to act out the stories of Alexander the Great, Napoleon and others. The expansion did require the player to have the base game, but it was sold as a gold edition later on which included the full package for people who were new to the series. Ten years after Thrones and Patriots was released, Rise of Nations also got a Steam release as Rise of Nations Extended Edition, which included the original game and the expansion. It's kind of similar to the release of Age of Empires 2 HD, and the Steam version brought things like multiplayer support, updated graphics, and inbuilt Twitch streaming capabilities, while it kept the core of the game untouched and exactly how it was on launch. I was really stoked to see Rise of Nations come out with the updated graphics and systems, as were many other fans of the series. The extended edition was received well all around, and it established a decently sized community on Steam, meaning if you want to pick up the game to play now with others, you shouldn't have much trouble doing so, which is always nice to say. Generally speaking, I think that real-time strategy games age far better than other popular genres such as shooters or RPGs, and therefore they're usually easier to pick up and play years or decades later after their release. The graphics tend to be enduring, and the core gameplay of the genre has generally held fast throughout its very storied history. The main difficulty these days is usually trying to run or acquire your favourite classic on today's systems. So is Rise of Nations worth playing in 2018? Yes, 100%. As the classic RTS is now a bit of a rare sight in the gaming industry, 2014 saw the timely Steam release of Rise of Nations, so it will run without any issues on a modern computer. It's also available for a reasonable price, with the base cost being around 20 bucks. And if that's too much for you, you can normally find it on sale for a lot less. It's a game I still have fun with to this day, and if I'm not careful, I can easily play away an entire evening through one single match alone. The long form gameplay is deeply satisfying and rewarding, and the variety offered through its many civilizations, unique units, and ages keep the game fresh and exciting even this long after release. And while it's not a game I can sit down for 30 minutes and play like I could for Impossible Creatures, it is one I go to when I want something that's more in depth. If you used to play Rise of Nations back in the day, then hopefully you won't need much convincing from me to go and relive the experience again. On the other hand however, both new and latecomers to the genre should find much to appreciate here, marrying the best traditional aspects of RTS games with elements from turn-based strategy games and their own innovation and differentiators to set itself apart from the pack. Rise of Nations successfully defied an overcrowded market at the time and it became one of the best RTSs of its day. It was by no means radical or pioneering, but it was obviously created with complete clarity in its vision and a high standard of quality in its development. I believe it has weathered the test of time and become a textbook example of a real-time strategy game done right, and it rightly deserves to be revisited today as a standard bearer for the genre. Thanks for watching everyone, we'll see you next time.